I am here with John, who you guys heard during the keynote. Um, and you heard that he was invited by Matt to join him at Automatic. So you likely know that he works at Automatic. Um, I want to start there just by asking, I mean, at the time you were, I think, Kleiner Perkins and also doing stuff with eBay. Um, and so uh, those are well-known companies, uh, a lot of influence, and, uh, and in some ways, Automatic was a company that also had influence, though not the same kind of dynamic. And so uh, how did you evaluate those, and how did you make that decision to decide to join Automatic? Well, it's a little embarrassing. I mean, you lost a bet. No, this may this may this may be bad to say in this room, in this community, but I I uh, two years ago left WordPress. Yeah. For all my sites, because six years prior I was at this event where I I had WordPress in like 2004. Loved it. And then I found this service called Posturus, mm -hmm. sort of a Gary Tan. Mm -hmm. I remember. I loved it. And so I moved to Posturus. And so five, six years ago, I'm at this thing, and this young man comes up to me, Matt Mullenweg, he says, Hi, I'm a co founder of WordPress, and I have this WordPress the thing, you know, which looked to me to move your blogs. I said, Because Posturus is going away. So I thought, Oh, yeah, please do that. So, move everything over, and from that very moment on, I could never figure out how to do the things do I needed anything. to do. Yeah. And I was like, oh my gosh, where is that? You know, I was like, he disappeared from me. And for years, just couldn't touch it. Didn't yeah. know how to. Yeah. Because WordPress world is hard. Yeah. Well, what's crazy is that for people who have been in it, right? I, I think I started in 2005. It had an interface, right? A particular look and feel. And then it just changed incrementally. So every step of change I absorbed with a tiny modicum of friction, right? Because I was just going through the change of the delta, right? So then you'd hear a whole community of people like that saying, well, WordPress is easy. And you're like, well, WordPress is easy because you're describing it as having learned from, you know, 3.0 to 3.1, not from, you know, 2.0 to 3.0 or 2.0 to 3.8, right? Where you're like, I don't know if you noticed this, but your menu items went from 6 to 346, right? And you're just like, where do I go? Where do I look? What do I do? We, we hadn't caught that because it was all just tiny incremental change, right? All I know is like I was, I was. Uh, it was winter, and I like to see what the young people do. And I, I saw the whole trend around, like you know, flat file websites, the old way. Yeah. Uh, Jekyll and things like that. Middleman. I was like, oh, what is this? And so I uh, wrote the code to take the exporter file and parse it my way, and then push it into this other format, and put it up in AWS, and it was like. Oh my gosh, it was like freedom. Yeah. I could actually touch everything again. And that's when I met Matt. Yeah. Again. So in case you don't have uh, background or context, there was a point in time where when we wanted to blog, we would uh, write stuff here, pull everything down, re-index, generate files, and then push it back up to what was a regular stupid folder, right? Like you just, you, you had a dumb hosting account with a dumb folder, none of it was fancy, and you just took files that your your computer would generate and you just push it back which meant you just write anything in the little app right and radio user land and all those I mean you go way back you just generate and then push it up of course if you made a change you had to redo it if you changed uh, permalinks or anything else right if you're changing the URL paths you might have to you know re-index everything and push it back up but you had total control right and then over time that that was changing right people are logging into sites and making changes and now there's servers and now there's well you're using Apache, but oh, now you're using uh, Nginx, and all these things are changing, and that makes it harder. And so when he mentions Jekyll, uh, it, is a, it, is a, it is a throwback approach, right? It is another, uh, which just, I mean, again, just to give some context, today, you would hope that we would have all of these websites that would load in femtoseconds. 
because it's, it's text, it's titles, maybe an image or two, right? With some sort of connection to CDN. Yet it's not that way, right? Because every single page load hits, you know, WordPress, which hits engines, which hits PHP, which hits the short code PHP file, which parses all the text, which is, and you're like, all that, I just wanted to write a paragraph, right? So Jekyll's approach was just, uh, you know, we'll just generate a whole bunch of HTML and throw it in the folder and then you're done again, right? So it's, it was almost coming all the way full circle. It's old school. Yeah. All I know is I had my stopwatch out and I was like, this is fast. Yeah. So anyways, I was really happy and that's when I met Matt again. <laughs> And I was like, oh, I remember you. You moved all my stuff over, and that was really nice, but I could never figure out how to, like, you know? And I said, well, he recognized that this thing you're describing, kind of the the frog in the boiling water, whatever. Yeah. Over time, it seemed okay to everyone who was in it. Yeah. But a newcomer would be like, or someone who came back after yeah. they stopped watching the TV show yeah. for three years. Just So we had to just rethink the whole thing. And we also needed to integrate JavaScript yeah. because the browser is so much more powerful today. Yeah. And I thought, well, okay. So he, he's aware. And number two, I could feel his passion for the people that had gotten WordPress to where it is. And he didn't want to let them down. Yeah. And... I like that, you know? Yeah. Feels like a commitment. And um, I like that he's like a 34 year old now hippie. Yeah. Um, and it's cool to get to work on freedom. Particularly, though, I'm interested less so in the. Um, the early years of the web, which was about freedom of speech, essentially, um, because now we have a, a lot of speech and it's whatever all over the place. Um, I'm more interested in financial freedom, which I think WordPress did for a lot of people. Yep. It was kind of like a, a, a college substitute. Uh, not just coding and marketing and design, all kinds of things. And I think that the um, closed platforms have taken it away from a lot of people. Okay. And so I believe that the open web is important to keep this kind of blue collar tech ecosystem really um, not just alive, but thriving. Yeah. And it won't thrive unless there is some kind of financial opportunity, not to become like the Elon Musk, you know, uh, right. you know, have like millions and millions of dollars, just like, I just want to feed my family, yeah. or I need to take care of my mom or dad, or I'd like to go out like once a month. So for me, that's what drives me now, is how to leverage the scale of WordPress, its position, and to really kind of hone in on the earning potential yeah. that WordPress brings, not just to the people who build sites, but for the people who own the sites. Yep. That excites me a lot. So your title at Automatic is wrong. It's because I realized uh, biographies are kind of like oversold. So I thought if my title became my like bio, yeah, it's you're, easy. you're set. Yeah. So tell us, tell us the title, the well, full title. Um, the first thing, it's because whenever you like begin something, you're the clearest. Yeah. Ever seen the movie um, uh, Memento? Memento. Yeah. Memento. Yeah. I forget everything, so I have to kind of like take a picture of it, take notes, and so in my title, I put everything I needed to remember. Uh, as I began <laughs> this right. journey. Yeah. The first is global, because the WordPress community is global. Uh, has anyone been to a WordCamp Europe event or anything like that? It's it's pretty amazing. Thank you. It's like a, it's like whoa. It's like Euro Disneyland, or it's all kind of the same, but they have waffles instead of whatever. You know, it's, like, it's it's very similar, and it's in different languages. It's double byte languages in some cases, but they're everyone speaking the same language of opportunity and freedom. Um, uh, and so global, because sometimes when you're when you're in the U.S., you think that you're kind of the center of the world, or if you speak English, you think that that's what drives everything, but it's only half the world. So um, global, and then uh, computational design, because uh, design is a really poorly designed word. 
because you think design is design on your head, is on your logo, or design or whatever. I'm primarily interested in computational design. Uh, computational design is what is able to uh, leverage the power of Moore's law, which is this doubling of processing speed every year and a half. And somehow when you harness your thinking to that engine, you're now moving at the speed of technology. Let me give you an example. So if you look at computers in the 1970s and you compare them to computers today, if you use Moore's Law's calculation, what it says is that the computers today are 9 billion times faster than the computers in the 1970s. So let me so to give you an analogy. Let's say you bought a car. It's an awesome car. 1970. It went 60 miles per hour. Cost $12,000, 15000 Now imagine you're in 2018. You're buying a car. It goes 100 miles per hour. No, actually it goes 9 billion miles per hour. <laughs> And it costs the same, if not less. And everybody has them. Now that is weird, but to your point, this boiling frog, if you're in it, you didn't notice it. But computers became space age fast. Yeah. And so if you're talking about design of my glasses or a logo, that's like last century. Any design involving uh, hundreds of people, thousands of people using a WordPress site, any kind of design involving some kind of testing that you can do now in so many bins, like all this stuff is like space age stuff, computational design. Lastly, inclusion. Yeah. Because uh, I learned over time that design is very simple as long as you remember that design is about the people you serve. It's being inclusive of the people that you serve. And you cannot design for them unless you hang out with them. Yeah. It's like, I know exactly what you all need because I know what a human being is. <laughs> They've got like a thing over here. They got these things attached to it, like a potato. And they're all the same. You know, and, I, and I'm just like that. So I'm going to design whatever. I realized that inclusion was the key to designing better products. And so I wanted to remember that as an important factor. Well, inclusion is one of those things that uh, if you don't make it a priority, it's easy to have it just kind of fall into the background. Um, I have a theory for why. Yeah. Um, I have a theory. It's because, like, over time, it's um, this word diversity and inclusion in organizations has tended to be owned by human resources. Right. And if you've seen The Office, there's Toby, head of HR, whatever. I mean, I, gotta, I, I love HR, by the way, but I don't think the average person is like, oh my gosh, HR. Right? Unless you're an HR person. Um, most people are like HR, they kind of do this, right? Because uh, it's all kind of legal, risk type of stuff. So it's kind of like putting all that stuff together and diverse inclusion feels more like a requirement. Um, and nobody likes things that are required because if you're not doing that, you're doing the wrong thing. So I'm more interested in bringing inclusion to product creation. Yep, yep. And if inclusion can help product creation, because the, the fundamental tenet that I learned in venture capital is that the most successful businesses have a large market. And this is a phrase called TAM, Total Addressable Market. So if your TAM is large, it means that you have potentially many customers. If your TAM is small, it means you're not gonna be able to grow as a, a business at the rate you might want to. So the best way to grow your TAM is to be inclusive of customers, people who are not like yourselves, which is so hard, because we think we're so smart. Like, I know exactly how that person, I watch a TV show, I watch them. I read a book, you know? Um, I had so many people, um, you know, I'm very interested in this political situation in the US and in Europe right now. 
because we tend to we tend to think diversity and inclusion in a certain way. And when you look at all of the, the kind of like uh, video and the alt-right type of stuff, whatever, um, it tends to paint a bleak picture of the Appalachian region. You know, those people over there, they're all one kind and, you know, um, and, and when you're like in a coastal uh, city, the first thing people will say, well, did you read the J.D. Vance's Hillbilly Elegy? Reviewed in the New York Times. Did you read that? Oh, I read it. I, I just totally get what's happening over there. <laughs> you know? Um, I realized that I suffered from that problem. So I went to the uh, Appalachian Mountains to meet uh, coal miners yeah. and coal mining towns. And it just really changed how I saw that region. Yeah. We, we're, we're reading it, that book at home right now, right? There you go. Um, and uh, it's, it was provided to us by a friend of ours whose uh, grandfather was out there, right? She's, she's now in California. Um, but it's great to have these conversations where someone's saying, well, here's my dad's story or my grandfather's story. And you're like, wow, that's definitely not my grandfather's story, right, from another country. And, you, and so you're just having these conversations about it. I, I have a fundamental belief that the reason diversity also ends up or inclusion, right, ends up being something that just, if it's not a top priority, it, it kind of fades in the background, is because it requires some discipline, especially in your time about product, not, not in the HR world, but in the product space, in building anything, it requires a kind of proactive step outside, step outside, connect with some other people, connect with some different people, challenge your own assumptions. And if you don't, if you don't actively do that, right, it's just a lot easier to do whatever's on your to-do list today and so it, it just starts falling back quietly, not not with a big rage. It just starts slowly not being on the list of things that you have time to do. Are, are you seeing or are you guys working on ways to get people out of the building or ways to get people connected? I mean, obviously, you're going all the way across the country to, to hang out with some people that are different from you, but are, are you seeing a, a, a set of patterns or dynamics or disciplines developing in the organization? I mean, you're, obviously, you're a remote organization, but you know, how are you helping people make that a, a practice? Oh, well, um... First of all, a lot of the um, uh, technology companies like Shopify and Facebook, when they began to work with businesses, they realized that they had lacuna. You know, uh, it's, it's interesting that um, in the diversity inclusion industry, uh, there's a lot of talk about blind spots. But it turns out that if you're blind, you don't like people saying blind spot. So I asked my lexicographer friend, is there a better word? Better word. And it's lacuna. It means having a gap. Yeah. So I guess what I found is that if you, let me, if you don't, so this, this whole idea of difference, if you look different, you're now different. But if you look the same, it gets hard. So one thing that I advocate for a lot is Caucasian men. Because people say, well, why do you do that? And I say, well, it's because they're not all the same. You know? Um, and unless we all recognize that we're all a little bit different, yeah. then we don't be curious about other people's differences. Right. That's how diverse inclusion can be non-inclusive. Um, and you raise your point about you read this book and you don't see similarities or you can find some similarities. When you talk with people, like in that region, let me give you an example. So there was a person, uh, Rusty. He runs an incubator where he supports coal miners who have lost their jobs to retrain and learn PHP and JavaScript. And they're building websites in the mountains to uh, remotely. Uh, but I was so struck by how he said, he said something like, you know, I talk like this. It's called talking hillbilly. And so I, it's in the media, you're taught to think it makes you sound stupid. And I never thought about that. You know, I just kind of paused, just listening to him. And he said a lot of cultures, immigrant cultures, they talk funny and, and they're stupid. And I was like, whoa, this is so interesting. And then the other day I was um, watching like an Amazon or whatever, video or whatever, and they were, they brought, they were, they brought back the, the Beverly Hillbillies. And, you know, as a kid, I thought it was really funny. But when you watch it, you're like, wow, if I was in that area, 
It's been so deeply enculturated. Like, I guess I, that would be bad to me too, you know? Um, when I was in the region, um, I was traveling with a group. Uh, one person was an uh, ex-White House legal counsel division who's uh, African-American. And she, she, she said, you know, well, you feel sorry for these people, but don't forget African-Americans have been left out of many opportunities for multi-generations, which you could apply to many immigrant categories, too. Yeah. And I thought, wow, this is really messy. <laughs> you know? This is messy. But I like it. Because if we can understand all of our differences and we can communicate about them and kind of get excited about it and design in that way to be inclusive. Um, in the article I pointed out in Quartz, I didn't know this, but uh, it's true. If you go into any um, Slack, anyone's Slack, if you look at the public channels, if you count the speakers, they will index mail. It's just, it's true, it's index mail, and, um, and, I, and, I, and I wasn't sure why, um, but uh, when you read the article, and again, this is generalizations, this isn't everybody, but um, the, this, this article points out that um, once you have a, a, a bias towards this kind of male-centric chatter in a Slack, it excludes people who don't want to behave like that. Yeah. I'm sure, and even like introverted men too, it, it just, it isn't conducive. Right. And suddenly you're like, ah, oh, I can't be a part of that, whatever. And the simple way to correct that, that's suggested, is to do what these researchers have observed is visible in healthy, primarily women-based chats, Slack rooms, which is being supportive of, of each other. <laughs> You know, like Chris said this. Did you notice that? You know, uh, Sam said this. Did you see that? And I thought, wow, that'd be a much better Slack group <laughs> <laughs> than the one. I mean, right? The one where people just drop a link and drop a link, and it's like, oh, okay, I don't really know what I'm learning here. But if I don't drop a link, am I stupid or whatever? But and so, like from that, I learned like, oh, I should do that more of that too. So, but you only do that unless you create the dissonance in your mind yep. that this normal thing isn't really a great thing. And so how can technologies be designed differently? Like a, take a WordPress and a commenting system. Uh, for instance, um, uh, one thing that we had is that we had a design and exclusion. We have a design and exclusion podcast available. It's a four hour resource to talk about how much harder it is to be online if you are a woman or any other tech-based discriminatory group. Uh, and it was it started because a friend of mine said to me, "Just change your avatar to be a woman, and see what happens." And see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. And so in a different network, I tried that, and it was really like, Ugh, "What is this?" Yeah. It is night and day. Yeah. But I wasn't aware, you know. Yeah. So, but once you become aware, you're like, I don't know if this is, you know. It's like, ah, oh, let's do something about it. That's how I feel right now. I don't know what to do. But right. I know I've become aware. Yep. And are you seeing that permeate through your teams? Definitely. Because all I say, I look, that's my title. My title. Right. Inclusion. Right. <laughs> inclusion. Inclusion. And we have Ashley. Yep. Inclusion. Uh, a lot of the messages I share inside, not just automatic, but in right. every gathering I'm at, right. um, I try to point out the logic that um, I find odd. No. It's all because of the fortune of uh, an accident I had. What accident? Um, I tripped while jogging. I have this, uh, I have like nine pins in here. Um, I tripped and um, I was lucky that, you know, just shattered this, whatever. It was, I was lucky. I felt really lucky and I thought, wow, I've been saved for some reason. What is it? And it was at that very moment that I realized that I'm Asian. <laughs> Second, I don't know. You didn't know you were Asian until that Asian. moment. No, yeah. just like it's like oh, I didn't know that. Oh, that's why that. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, but I just wasn't aware. Um, and then I realized that it was that moment where um, I'm a big Star Trek fan. Um, and I remembered 
because I had the opportunity to speak at the Star Trek 50th anniversary thing. And as a, as a nerd, I was like, oh, that's awesome. But I didn't realize that it was started in 1966, the same year I was born. And I pointed out how, when I was a kid, I remember thinking it was strange that Sulu spoke with regular, like, unaccent English. Right. Now, should he speak, like, with that kind of, you know, the accent? And I thought, that's really weird. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I was like, wow, I'm so conditioned to seeing things a certain way. So I thought, now at this time in my life, I should work to change that wherever I can. And you're doing a lot, not just with adults, you're also doing stuff with kids. Yeah, well, um, yeah, we did a project to work with the classroom in Appalachia, and um, it's just been fun because um, because we're a remote ecosystem, this is WordPress in general, yeah. uh, it means that really anything is possible, especially with uh, low-cost, uh, high-end video conferencing systems yeah. today. Um, Rusty uh, brought up how he looked at us and said, you all are city people, um, well, you know, city people live in 3D. 3D meaning like, you know, skyscrapers, 3D. And he said, if you live in a town, you're living 2D. Yeah. You're like moving around like this in a town. He says, we live in 1D off of one street. And that's how I realized, if you're in this technology world, you're living in 0D, where you can beat space time, and you can connect with anybody. And so I remember when I was able to get a few designers interested in working with this uh, little town, and we brought in the superintendent, and um, uh, two very strong, liberally-minded designers on the call, the video call. And I remember when the superintendent, David, said, I'm so excited about this. You know, I'm going to see Mitch McConnell on Monday, and I can't wait to tell him about this. And you can see the designers just dropped. <laughs> But, after that call, direction was, he seemed like a nice guy, <laughs> really cares about his students, huh, you know what I mean? Right. Well, one of the things that I appreciate about the work you're doing, and, and in general, right, and all the folks that are doing work with, with children, right, is that you're, you're, we're creating opportunities for them. Creating opportunities for them to uh, have different experiences uh, with different people and using these platforms to, to make it a part of what they consider their normal, right? And uh, I think one of the ways that we work through inclusion, right, is making sure that all different kinds of kids have that option, right, not just 3D ch children, right? Yeah, that's why I'm excited about WordPress, because I think that the install base is so broad and the socioeconomic diversity is so great that its impact for more younger people is, is important because of PHP. Let's talk about yeah. PHP for a second. Um, PHP is no longer cool. JavaScript is in. And the problem with JavaScript, with each iteration, the computer science people get excited. And they throw in what's called syntactic sugar. Syntactic sugar is not sugar. <laughs> It's like some kind of, I don't know what it is, it's like some kind of Willy Wonka factory sugar. So you're like, what is that sugar? Oh, it's really good. Meaning that it makes it harder to understand and actually excluding more people. Yeah. Whereas PHP is really easy to read. It's as bad as Perl. It's not a really good computer language, but it's legible enough. Kind of like a car, an old car, you open up the hood, you're like, oh, that's that part, that's that part. Maybe if I touch this, this will change, you know? So I guess I'm hopeful that we'll see WordPress, PHP base, that part of it, as not antiquated, but the on ramp. On -ramp. Yep. For more people, because like if you look at Facebook's code, anything that big, it's like, eh. Um, so I'm hopeful that we'll find more avenues to more young people to get into code versus this, you know, like let's code. It's very abstract. Right. So let's code. But we have this amazing built-in community that 
could be the partners to facilitate their growth. That's awesome. That's awesome. So if we have question, time for one question for Sean. Yeah, in the back. Hey, uh, just one comment and then one leading question. The comment is, uh, I agree with Sean's point that the <laughs> the language of diversity and inclusion it is kind of couched and oriented in, in sort of the, the language of shame and the language of the language, like anger and um, because I, you know for me um, for me I think it's a joyous sort of process and it's a that joyous sort of process and yeah. I think that um, I, I think a lot of people approach it from a different Well, um, you know, at, at MIT, when I was at MIT, I was wonderfully naive. So I'd like walk into walls and like, you know, it's awesome. And um, I remember like being at some kind of cocktail thing with the muckamucks. You know what muckamucks are? Muckamucks important people. Uh, I was in the muckamucks and um, I said to the, to the, to, uh, the chancellor at MIT, I said, hey, you know, I'd love to be on a committee, you know, committee. He looked at me like, you want to be on a committee? And he pulled out his Palm Pilot and typed his name into the, my, you know, my name into the Palm Pilot. And then, like a week later, so he called me up and said, I've got a really important committee for you to run. And I said, what's that? This is the Working Family Committee. I said, that sounds great, sir. I'll take it on. And when I joined, I realized it was the most undesirable committee. <laughs> but it was the most interesting committee because it was about uh, burnout and work. It was about graduate student child care. But more importantly, it was about employees with elder care issues. And loved it. So I was able to organize that and went well. And so three years later, he calls me up. Well done. I've got another very important committee for you to run. So I'm ready for it. I thought it was going to be the big one, you know, the good ones. It's the Race and, Rela Race and Cultural Relations Committee. I said, I can't wait. So I show up to this committee and I showed up. Everyone's like, no, it's the worst committee that we have. And you're like, oh, <laughs> great. I love fixer-uppers. Um, but it's there that everything, my understanding of diversity and inclusion changed dramatically. Because I would hear all kind of like terribly, terrible things happening every week. This is like the 21st century. I would hear things like um, students showing up in class late and the professor saying, you know, you're late, you're exhibiting uh, Latin American qualities. You know, or, or all this kind of stuff you'd hear, and you're like, really? This is like the 21st century? This is actually happening? And, uh, you know, um, but the thing that changed, shifted everything into view was when there was a Native American student and he was talking about the difficulties he'd experienced. It was terrible things he was described. And so, as a chair, I I wanted to empathize with him. And you know, like, well, you know, I'm, I didn't know I was Asian back then too, actually. Uh, you know, I've been called these kinds of things. I've had a bottle thrown at me. I've, I've had stuff happen, and I know, and I know, and I know it's terrible. He looked at me, and he said, "You have no idea what I've gone through. <laughs> you know, you've gone through a kind of immigrant racism." I've gone through an indigenous person racism. And I, I sat from and I thought, yeah, it's, it's different. See, everyone's, everyone's hurt is different. It's very independent and unique. So, yes, there's a lot of strong anger because the hurt is real. That said, uh, I, I seek to have a, another part to develop which is, I hate to say it, uh, purely business-minded. Um, I just believe that inclusion is good business. I just believe that it helps you create better designs for products and services. Um, people ask me, why don't I talk about this over here? My point is, this is there's a lot of this, and I support all of it. But I'm squarely focused on this kind of inclusion. Let's get up for John.
All right, we're going to take a uh, couple-minute break, and then we'll have another talk in here.